Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Wednesday, April the 3rd, 2019. It's 4 p.m. in New York. It's 1 p.m. in Los Angeles. It's 9 p.m. in London. Sydney, Australia is around 8 in the morning. But wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And I'm happy because, once again, it's Neville Day. and We get to explore the Yay. writings and the teachings of Neville Goddard. Hey, Cindy, how about this? Neville Day has returned. How about that? Yes, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're, we're in Neville business. <laughs> it's already April, too. It's amazing. I know. Isn't that crazy? Like, wow. Yeah. I keep telling myself I want to try to learn how to slow time down. I seem to be getting the opposite effect. There must be something about what I'm putting out there. <laughs> I'm serious. I think everything else is slowing down and time is just speeding by or something. I don't <laughs> That's know. what it is, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But no, it, Hey, it's all good because Neville Day is always a fun day. And uh, yes. I, I think we're... We, we had a, a challenging chapter last week, but we're past that part. So I think we're going to start getting into uh, smoother waters, shall we say? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, I, I always think it's funny whenever we've been working our way through Neville Goddard's Your Faith is Your Fortune. And as evidenced by the title, uh, this book has a particularly large uh, segments of... Christian scripture mm. that Neville is explaining in his own unique way. Oh yes, and I think it's and I always think it's really funny because neither one of us are Christians. Right? How about that? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and so it's like <laughs> I'll start to read a little bit ahead, and I certainly have a grasp on the Christian doctrines as, as well as I think Neville's takes on them. Mm -hmm. But I, I always still think it's funny that it's us it that's doing this because yeah. it, you know. But the, the only reason we can do this is because you're so well-versed, not just in Christianity, but in all the major religions. I mean, uh, your, your own faith, you're Jewish, um, you're well-studied in Christianity, you know quite a bit about Buddhism, and you know Neville. I mean, that's what makes this possible. You, you draw from all these different disciplines. I mean, I, I have some knowledge of these, but I mean, I, I just sit here sometimes in awe of some of the things you come out with. So, <laughs> Well, it's let's very see helpful. what we can do today. Because Neville's going to get right into the doctrine of the Trinity, mm. which, yeah. <laughs> Talk about being and, right at the core of Christianity. <laughs> right, and here's the thing that I really think is so interesting, is that at first glance, you know, just knowing, okay, today we're going to talk about the Trinity, it's like what you said, it's like, oh my goodness, we're into this really deep, core, central tenet of Christianity. Um but Neville is going to say some r things about that that probably wouldn't fly in most Christian Not churches. Not really, no, no. I think probably that's be considered like heresy. Oh yes. In a lot of <laughs> so it should be interesting. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the reasons we love him so much because he does he he isn't afraid to kind of push the boundaries a bit. You know, he he takes mm. a doctrine that he believes in, yeah. but but he rearranges it in a way that makes much more sense to him, and he doesn't really worry about whether or not the the, the traditional church believed in it. He just says, let's go with it. This, this makes more sense. This actually works better. Right. And Neville was also, um, I think he even would use this word to describe himself, a mystic, mm. somewhat of a mystic. So a lot of Neville's teachings are based on experiences that he has had. And mm -hmm. we all know that once we've had an experience, it's very hard for someone to tell us, you know, that whatever it is we've experienced isn't true because no, sure. we've experienced it. Yeah. So to us, it's it's a done deal. It's a fact. And so for Neville, a lot of these things were based on his mystical experiences. So he certainly believes what he's teaching. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And it's just interesting to kind of see what it is. Are you ready to dive in? Uh, just about. I mean, if you're listening to the live stream, if you're among the few who do that, uh, feel free to jump in with any questions in the comments section there, because we'll be glad to tie it into the conversation here and see if we can uh, help to enlighten you and elucidate on some of what Neville talks about, because it can be a little <laughs> confusing sometimes. But, you know, feel free to jump As in. As we try that. to enlighten ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No kidding. As we try to figure it out. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. But All with right. that thought in mind, yeah, let's dive in. All right. Well, Neville's we're in chapter 16 of Your Faith is Your Fortune. 
Uh, as we've already laid out the ideas that Neville Neville's ideas and definitions of things and his explanations are very different than mm. anything that's ever been mainstream. Um, this particular chapter, chapter 16, is titled The Triune God. And Neville starts right off the bat with a verse from Genesis that says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I have to say, this is one of the few times I actually appreciate a Christian Bible verse in a big way, because that's exactly what I believed for the longest of time. So it's like, okay, now that's something I can hang my hat on. I agree with that. Hmm. Um, what, explain that a little bit. What do you mean? Well, the only thing that I think I would disagree with on it is that there is a tendency in most cases to separate man and God. But the idea of making man in our image is about as close as the Bible knows how to come to actually stating we are God. This is a concept that, okay. that, that Neville plays out very specifically in a way that you really don't get from biblical teaching. But it's really accurate. We, I mean, the, the Christian doctrine will tell you we are all created by God. And we are uh, made in his image. So, it, And we are the children of God. So we are like the second class citizens of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're like not quite God. You know, we don't really have God power, according to the Christian doctrine, but we're made in his image, so you know, there's something good there. But I take that to mean, well, if we're made in his image, it's like having the, the same DNA. If we've got the same DNA, mm -hmm. then, and, and we're from the same energy source, which I believe we are, then, yeah, we, we can try to treat us as being children of God and inferior, but ultimately we grow up to be God. You know, it, it, it's, that's just the way stuff works. You know, you, it, if you're the child of, of a father or a mother, then you grow up to be an adult like the father or the mother. And, and that's who we are. Mm -hmm. We are grown beings. So when you take it to its log logical conclusion, then I can completely agree with what, uh, with the, the, the verse that Neville pulled out here. Because not only were we made in God's image, we have grown into, we have become God. We are God. And in fact, Neville ties those, those um, concepts together really, really tightly. He's been doing that by equating God with consciousness and with imagination and the kingdom of God and all these different um, uh, analogies and, and uh, this equals that kind of thing that he does, making it really clear, this is us. We, In essence, we created ourselves. That, that's not an unlikely statement. We, we are our own creation. And it's a little bit mind-bending. It's a little bit out there for traditional Christianity, but it certainly resonates with me, I can tell you that. <laughs> right, and I, I see that he pulled this verse out because of the plurality of it. Yes. Let us make man in our image, yes. after our likeness, and not let me make man in my image. Uh, right? Je Jeffrey's in a good mood today. He says, I never ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> good to see you, so, Jeff. So Neville says, having discovered God to be our awareness of being, and that's what we've been talking about in the previous chapters, uh, you were just mentioning that. Mm -hmm. So having discovered God to be our awareness of being and this unconditioned, changeless reality, the I am, to be the only creator, let us see why the Bible records a trinity as the creator of the world. So I'm going to go, um, I'm going to add a, a little comment here. Okay. Just to say that the verse that's quoted is actually from the Jewish Bible or the Torah. And the word in the original for our image, I believe it's Elohim. It means, it means gods. It's uh -huh. a plural word. It doesn't mean three. <laughs> so Christianity decided it meant three. Mm -hmm. So when he says, let us see why the Bible records a trinity as the creator of the world, my commentary there, my little additional commentary is, let us see why the Christian Bible records mm. a trinity as the creator of the world. Right. Uh, because the original text doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's keep moving. He says in the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, it is stated, and God said, let us make man in our image. The churches refer to this plurality of gods as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What is meant by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they have never attempted to explain, for they are in the dark concerning this mystery. <laughs> you know, I buy into so, that. I really do buy into that. I think it's true. <laughs> so never believe the Christian church to be in the dark about what this really meant. Yeah, and I think so. Even though they were the ones that came up with that 
triune no, that, that number, right? So, mm-hmm. but he's going to explain it to us. So okay. He says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three aspects or conditions of the unconditioned awareness of being called God. The consciousness of being precedes the consciousness of being something. And we talked about this last week where Neville says we need to, we, we always move on to I am man mm-hmm. or I am whatever when right. we need to back up and just go with I am because exactly. that's more powerful than limiting ourselves, right? And more so specific he says, too. Yeah, the consciousness of being precedes the consciousness of being something. That unconditioned awareness, which preceded all states of awareness, is God. I am. The three conditioned aspects or divisions of itself can best be told in this manner. The receptive attitude of mind is that aspect which receives impressions and therefore may be likened to a womb or a mother. That which makes the impression is the male or pressing aspect, and is therefore known as father. The impression in time becomes an expression, which expression is ever the likeness and image of the impression. Therefore, this objectified aspect is said to be the son, bearing witness of his father-mother. An understanding of this mystery of the Trinity enables the one who understands it to completely transform his world, and fashion it to his own liking. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on that? See, the, the, the one thought I have is where he is talking about um, the father and the mother. And there's a word in Hebrew that often gets translated to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And it's a feminine word in the original language. Because Hebrew is a gendered language, so it's, it's actually a feminine word, not a masculine word. Okay. So that kind of would make sense. Okay. Um, if he was using this second piece, mother, as the Holy Spirit and not the son. <laughs> so I'm not sure what he's doing there, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> well, also, I mean, he's, he, his uh, little analogy of mother or womb being the receptive attitude of the mind, father being that is which is impressed, he, he's describing the thought process. The thought process. Right, and he just, he talked about this before, right? With yeah. the, the conscious and the subconscious. Right. Which he said are actually one thing, but he's making a designation just to help us understand it. And he said the subconscious was like the womb of creation. Mm-hmm. And the conscious was like the, the seed or, you know, the father planting something, the idea being planted in the subconscious where right. it is created. So this all ties in very nice and neatly to what he's taught previously. And it makes sense because the subconscious mind, as we understand it, is a receptive mind. It doesn't generate anything on its own. It receives what we often call tapes and just keeps playing them over and over and over again until we give us give it new tapes to play. And and it right. just keeps receiving and receiving and receiving and then regurgitating, regurgitating, regurgitating. <laughs> and it's interesting because Neville says that the subconscious is actually the thing that's doing the creating. That all the things that we see being created are being created by our, by the subconscious. So that kind of makes sense in this whole analogy. So let's see what he says before, here. Before, he before says you go here, forward, before you go forward, I got a question for you. I also have a comment from Jamie. Jamie says, "Boy, I'm going to have to really contemplate this explanation of Holy Trinity." So we've, we've blown some minds here already, which is a, which is a okay, good thing. Well, yeah. Neville's blowing the mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And Jeffrey has a couple questions. Or actually, one question. He says. I've been wanting to ask, but I didn't want to overturn the apple cart. What limits us to one God? Why not look at what the polytheistic mystics talk about? Which is a fair question. Yeah, well, I'm I'm not limited to what one God. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can tell you what what limits anyone to one God is religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yep. A system or a structure that says there's only one God, or right. you sh- or you should only have one God. Right. Um, and so no one's limited to that. And if, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a great topic for discussion, honestly. <laughs> and it's a great point, what you just made, because it is religion that limits it. I mean, Christianity does it in the very first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other God before me. I mean, it's pretty clear. There's just one. <laughs> right. And it's only one, and it's not you. 
right. So, so Neville says, here's a practical application of this mystery. And I'm telling you, practical is like something that I love dearly. And I've, I've had clients tell me that they were, that was the one thing that impressed them about working with me as a coach is that the things that I gave them or homework or whatever was actually practical and they could do it. And I think that's important. Like I want to be able to apply something practically and not just have it be like, what is he talking about? Mm -hmm. I think I understand it, but I don't know what to do with it. Right. So I get excited when he says, okay, here, I'm going to teach you a practical way to deal Mm -hmm. with this. So I'm excited about seeing what he, where he goes here. He says, sit quietly and decide what it is you'd like most to express or possess. After you have decided, close your eyes and take your attention completely away from all that would deny the realization of the thing desired. Well, that's a key step. Then, assume a receptive attitude of mind and play the game of supposing by imagining how you would feel if you were now to realize your desire. So this is like Neville through and through, right? It is. This is pure. Le- this this is uh, what's what's the phrase that you always like to quote of his? I can't remember what it is. Assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, that's what this is. And right if here. we think about, I mean, this was his first book. Yes. So we've read some of the the later books, and he mm-hmm. was very strong in this point right here. Yeah. He says, "Play the game of supposing by imagining how you would feel if you were now to realize your desire. Begin to listen." as though space were talking to you and telling you that you are now that which you desire to be. This receptive attitude is the state of consciousness that you must assume before an impression can be made. And that's interesting right there because he's already told us about that, you know, in his analogy of a, of a Trinity, he's told us that the father is making an impression in the mother or the consciousness is making an impression in the subconscious. So he says this receptive attitude is the state of consciousness that you must assume before an impression can be made. That's right out of Abraham. It sounds to me like we have have to be be here before. Yeah. Well, that's that's the Abraham concept. You have to be ready to receive. Abraham Abraham puts it as the third step, but you have to be ready to receive. Otherwise, none of that's going to work. Somebody had asked a question of us um, on this live stream, maybe, I don't know, a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. But I remember someone asking a question about how come sometimes, you know, you try to manifest something and it seems to come really easy, but Mm -hmm. then it goes away or then everything falls apart. And our answer was that, well, because sometimes we're not really ready for that thing. Mm -hmm. We think we are, but we're not. And that's what this reminds me of. Although Neville is saying that, that th- we can't even have an impression made if we're not in this state. True. Yeah. By the way, Jamie, As this- Jamie left us a comment. She says, my life experience affirms the notion that the subconscious is the creator. And this would mean that subconscious is pure awareness. Sense awareness is the creator. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. As this yeah. pliable and impressive state of mind is attained, Then begin to impress upon yourself the fact that you are that which you desired to be by claiming and feeling that you are now expressing and possessing that which you had decided to be and have. Continue in this attitude until the impression is made. I think this is so interesting. He's going into this great depth about us being ready to have the impressive, the impression made and to stay in this attitude until the impression is made. Right. As you contemplate being and possessing that which you have decided to be and to have, you will notice that with every inhalation of breath, a joyful thrill courses through your entire being. Um, I've experienced this for sure. Mm-hmm. He says this thrill increases in intensity as you feel more and more joy the joy of being that which you are claiming yourself to be. That's I know really dis- we talked about this before, about these exercises like this, doing this just for the enjoyment of it. Yes. Yeah. Not to not to make something happen, not to create something, just dial all that back and just do this just because it's an enjoyable thing to do. Mm-hmm. He's really pointing that out here, right? 
Yes. This thrill increases in intensity as you feel more and more the joy of being that which you are claiming yourself to be. And then, in one final deep inhalation, your whole being will explode with the joy of accomplishment, and you will know by your feeling that you are impregnated by God the <laughs> Father. <laughs> so he, he's really going with this uh, analogy about as hard yeah. as you can. He really does. He says, as soon as the impression is made, open your eyes and return to the world that but a few moments before you had shut out. In this receptive attitude of yours, while you contemplated being that which you desired to be, you were actually performing the spiritual act of generation. So you are now on your return from this silent meditation, a pregnant being bearing a child of impression, which child was immaculately conceived without the aid of man. <laughs> <laughs> he does like to try it all together. <laughs> Doubt is the only force capable of disturbing the seed or impression. To avoid a miscarriage of so wonderful a child, walk in secrecy through the necessary interval of time that it will take the impression to become an expression. Tell no man of your spiritual romance. Lock your secret within you in joy, confident and happy that someday you will bear the son of your lover by expressing and possessing the nature of your impression. Then you will know the mystery of God said, let us make man in our image. You will know that the plurality of gods referred to is the three aspects of your own consciousness and that you are the Trinity meeting in a spiritual conclave to fashion a world in the image and likeness of that which you are conscious of being. That's good. And I, I was uh, struck a few sentences back where uh, you were reading how he was describing um, where is it? The, this thrill increases in intensity as you feel more and more the joy of being that which you are claiming yourself to be and so on. He was, in my mind, very clearly describing the same concept that Abraham Hicks describes when they talk about putting a thought into your vortex and focusing on it and, and staying with it and staying with it and building the volume of it up. That thrill is growing and growing and growing. He's describing the same thing. He's doing it in different terms, but he's describing the same yeah. thing. And But the only difference I can I can detect and it's a really slight one, is that Abraham will point out, well, it shows up immediately in your vortex. The only thing that, that's missing is to have it show up in your life, and that depends on how much resistance you're putting up. He's saying it'll take time for the child to be born. So that's about the only difference I can see, but it's, it's, it's a metaphorical difference more than anything else. I don't think there's a practical difference going on there. Yeah, and I think practically, when we think of things... Now, I've had things happen really fast, like things that I wanted to create. Um, I've had things manifest much faster than I expected them oh, to, or too. much faster than I would that I would think they could imagine if someone asked me how long will this take. Right. Um, but most of the time, they're not instantaneous. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, because we live in a world where we experience time, and we experience processes. We experience a certain process. You know, like they always, he's using pregnancy here, um, as his analogy, but we often also use planting seeds in a garden as an analogy. And we all know that there is, you know, we may plant seeds and say, wow, those seeds sprouted really quickly. And I can't believe the plants are as tall as they are. They're growing so quickly. But they still took a certain amount of time. Generally speaking, we don't put a seed in the ground, cover it up, and the flower pops up. You know, <laughs> it's, we don't see that because of, uh, because of, the planet that we live on mm -hmm. yeah, things sure. have a certain amount of time that they take to manifest to every so season, I think turn, that, turn, uh, turn. <laughs> I agree I, I can say okay it, it it appears immediately in your vortex mm -hmm. yep but it it's does. as within as without as above so below that transition often takes a little bit of time and Jamie like the um <laughs> The, the particular point about enjoyment, she says this is an important piece of advice. You do this for enjoyment, not as a chore, because enjoyment is a form of appreciation, which is a great point. Um, and she, nice point, yeah. She also goes on to say awareness of what is or the facts rather than awareness of the fulfillment of the wish is a, is a key portion here, and that's also true. Jeffrey has a question. Jeffrey says, do we also create our own doubt, and why do we create our own doubt? That's a good question, that, because that, that's like the most common thing that we do, right? 
Yeah, well, hopefully it's not the most common thing. That well, this is true. With. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, yes, I think we are sometimes co-creators of doubt. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times, we've talked about this before, when we want to create a certain thing or we have a certain goal in our life that we want to, you know, manifest. And if we tell certain people often they kind of rain on our parade and mm. even sometimes it's with the best intentions oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because they don't want us to be disappointed and they think we're right. reaching for the stars and maybe they think we're going a little bit too big. And so they may say to us things like, well, you know, it, it's okay if you, if that doesn't happen, maybe you sh you could do this instead, or maybe you'd have more luck if you went in this direction or, you know, and a lot of those dream crushers, <laughs> Those statements can definitely cause us to start doubting. Mm -hmm. Maybe so-and-so is right when they said that this is, you know, an impossibility for me. Maybe, you know, and, and a lot of times whatever they're, whatever they're stating to us, they're, they're facts, right? Sure, it's like, well. oh, I, I just, I just applied for a job at this company. Oh, well, they never hire anybody that doesn't have a master's degree. And we harden And maybe right that's true. And maybe that truth is, that fact is going to change tomorrow when they hire you. Mm. Right? Yeah. But a lot of times that causes us to doubt, oh no, I just found out whatever. It's mm. like, it doesn't look like this is possible. Exactly. So I think sometimes the doubts, we create our own doubt, yes, but sometimes we have help. <laughs> oh, we have lots of help. <laughs> We, 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 loved ones and neighbors. we have volunteers. We have people coming out of the woodwork. Hey, you know, I can tell you some doubt. You know, here's some great doubt to know about. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, but I think it's just that we often place our beliefs on things that have happened in the past. That's another thing is that uh, those are assumptions, right? And mm -hmm. so we realize, well, we assume that, that something's going to happen because that's what happened before. I mean, just like in the little, you know, off the cuff idea I gave about a job, mm -hmm. someone would assume you're not going to get the job because right. what I heard was that they're not going to hire someone who doesn't have a master's exactly. degree or whatever it is. Yeah. And so we, we make these assumptions based on our past experience. And the more something happens to us, the more often something has been the result, then Sometimes those assumptions are really, really tough mm -hmm. to break because mm -hmm. we say, look, I've, I've done this 15 times and I got the same result every single time. Isn't that annoying when that <laughs> happens? I get so pissed. I mean, I get, I get the same result <laughs> over and over again. I, I was expecting a different result. What's going on here? <laughs> but, right. oh, and by the way, the last thing that I quoted from Jamie, I, I missed a key point. That was her replying to Jeffrey's question. So her reply to his question, let me just re restate it in that context, is awareness of what is or the facts rather than awareness of the full fulfillment of our of the wish that's what happens when we create our own doubts and so so now we're Ooh, kinda, yeah uh, that's really fits in. i love i love the way uh you use the word facts there right because mm. we all know that it's like what is but this is the way it is <laughs> anytime you catch yourself saying well that's just the way it is that's a big red flag to take a look at your belief system right because yeah. right yeah that's exactly yeah, it. Yeah. Sure. And, and also, uh, Jamie also points out that Neville would say we assume a state of doubt and then manifest evidence of that state. <laughs> That's really what we do. We assume this, the, the feeling of, of an, a wish fulfilled, but it's not really a wish we wanted in the first place. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we, if we assume a state of doubt and then we manifest the evidence to prove it, that's where those assumptions start happening mm -hmm. because we say no. Uh, or what about this one where people say, oh, I knew this wasn't going to work. Yes. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> but I, I'm sure I've done that before. Oh, at uh, least a thousand times for me. <laughs> <laughs> QED. It's good to be able to know it's all a learning experience. It is. All just yeah. we're, we're continuing yeah. to practice. Jeffrey does uh, finish up by saying, I would like to create more support, compassion, and understanding. So thank you for helping me with that. So good. I'm glad we're helping, Jeffrey. That's a good thing. I'm glad, too. We finished a chapter, and if you want to, we can zoom yeah, on to the next going to 17. One. Why not? And we're, we're, we're dealing uh, with some core topics here, and this is definitely a core Christian topic, so let's go for it. Well, this one is called prayer. And I have to say, you know, I don't know what your feeling is on this, but I kind of lump prayers and wishes and spells and 
um, thoughts and all of these things, they just all get lumped together for me. Meditation, yeah. you know, they are all just an energy, an idea that we're putting out into the universe with an idea of receiving something, some kind of result from them. Mm -hmm. So we pray for things, we wish for things, we may cast spells for things, we, we give blessings, we give wishes, you know, to me, all of those things are just piled into actually the same thing with a whole bunch of different names. So I agree <laughs> we'll with you. What I, Neville well, when I was growing <laughs> up, I mean, I grew up in a Christian church and the Christian faith. It was a Presbyterian church and I was taught to pray. I was taught to say my prayers going to bed. I, I was taught to pray before dinner. I was taught to pray in church, all that kind of thing. And yet all that time, I really recall it very clearly wondering what was, what, what was it that we were really doing here? What was so special about this? Why was this such an important thing? And my father, who was devoutly religious, would try very hard to explain, and my mom would try to follow up with her explanations too. And there was kind of a ring of truth to what they were talking about. But deep down, I felt like there was a key piece missing. Like, it, it felt hollow, if that makes sense. It, it felt mm -hmm. kind of like there was kind of an emptiness to it. And over, it took me a long time to understand what that hollow emptiness was, but I now understand what it is. It was trying to separate prayer from all those other things that you listed. It was trying to say that prayer is different from thought, that it's, that prayer is different from wishes, that it's different from, it's different from all that stuff. It's its own little thing mm -hmm. all to itself in its own little, uh, ballpark. And it's the only thing that plays there. And it's the only way to communicate with God. And now that I understand it that way, I say to myself, my God, what a lie that was. <laughs> I mean, I was just being, the wool was being pulled over my eyes for a bit there until I finally said, wait a minute, this, this just doesn't feel right. It just doesn't feel right. It's interesting. You know, you said you were taught to pray, pray before bed, and then you said pray before dinner. It made right. me think that's another one, is that most of the time if we're praying or saying any kind of blessing before a meal, it's it's an experience of gratitude. We're right. grateful to have food, right. right? And so that's another one that can go on the list is, you know, we hear about this a lot in law of attraction circles is gratitude practices, mm -hmm. right? We make lists of things we're, grat we're grateful for. Um, that's one of my practices. Uh, you know, some of you may know I do a, um, a course every month that's around following the, the moon cycles. That's the full moon thing that, that always happens is gratitude. That's a form of prayer. So, I mean, there's so many things that pile into this. It's practically when we're walking in this kind of way where you're realizing who you really are and the power you really have, then almost every thought you have is a prayer, right? And I've thought about that often. What if every word we spoke was a prayer? Which it is. Um, because our words are powerful. Yeah. So let's see what Neville says. By Neville way, says... I have to share one of the comments here, uh, or actually two comments. Kevin says, I love today. And I, I take that to mean I love Neville Day specifically, but lo loving today is obviously a good thing. But I, I, I love Neville Day. Yes. Neville Day is fun. And then he says, he makes a comment very briefly that about chants that keep you safe or that kept you safe, which is kind of what the idea of a prayer was the way it was presented to me. It was a way of keeping you safe. Um, not so different mm -hmm. from other uh, belief systems that use uh, different variations of prayer to help keep you safe. That, that was part of the appeal for it for those of us who were taught it um, that particular way anyway. And, and what I be, that was part of what I began to realize. That, that's how I began to realize that the um, this whole feeling of it being its own little piece, its own little space and so forth, well, that, that, that was part of that. It was part of its own little space. That was how you kept yourself safe. As I learned about Law of Attraction many, many years later and realized that safe very often is the equivalent of a comfort zone, it's the equivalent of, you know, I, this is what I don't want to crawl out of. Now, all of a sudden, it has a new meaning, doesn't it? Prayer becomes, in the Christian way of, of limiting it, it becomes a way of hiding away from the world. <laughs> it's a way of protecting myself from all these terrible things that are going on out there. It's a, it's yeah. a spell. It's a magic spell that stuff. keeps me, keeps all that stuff at bay, which yeah. is a very limited, I mean, I'm not saying that it can't be that. I'm just saying it's a very limited way of understanding it. It just kind of reinforces that whole limited approach that was taught to me. Yeah, and I, I feel like the way we're talking about it now shows the lack of limitation in it mm -hmm. because, right, it can just engulf everything, all of the ways we think and speak, and that's a, a big deal. It's so. 
So Neville starts off Thank with you, a verse from the Christian Bible. He says, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which in which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And then another verse, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Neville says prayer is the most wonderful experience man can have. Unlike the daily murmurings of the vast majority of mankind in all lands, who by their vain repetitions hope to gain the ear of God, prayer is the ecstasy of a spiritual wedding taking place in the deep, silent stillness of consciousness. In its true sense, prayer is God's marriage ceremony. Just as a maid on her wedding day relinquishes the name of her family to assume the name of her husband, in like manner, one who prays much must relinquish his present name or nature and assume the nature of that for which he prays. The Gospels have clearly instructed man as to the performance of this ceremony in the following manner. When you pray, go within in secret and shut the door, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The going within is the entering of the bridal chamber. <laughs> Here he goes again. Yep. Just as no, <laughs> just as no one but the bride and groom are permitted to enter so holy a room as the bridal suite on the night of the marriage ceremony, likewise, no one but the one who prays and that for which he prays are permitted to enter the holy hour of prayer. As the bride and groom on entering the bridal suite securely shut the door against the outside world, so too must the one who enters the holy hour of prayer close the door of the senses and entirely shut out the world round about him. This is accomplished by taking the attention completely away from all things other than that with, with, with which you are now in love, the thing desired. The second phase of this spiritual ceremony is defined in these words. When you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall receive. As you joyfully contemplate being and possessing that which you desire to be and to have, you have taken this second step and are therefore spiritually performing the acts of marriage and generation. Your receptive attitude of mind while praying or contemplating can be likened to a bride or womb, for it is that aspect of mind which receives the impressions. That which you contemplate being is the groom. For it is the name or nature you assume, and therefore is that which leaves its impression or impregnation. So one dies to maidenhood or present nature as one assumes the name and nature of the impregnation. Lost in contemplation and having assumed the name and nature of the thing contemplated, your whole being thrills with the joy of being it. This thrill, which runs through your entire being as you appropriate the consciousness of your desire, is the proof that you are both married and impregnated. As you return from this silent meditation, the door is once more opened upon the world you had left behind. But this time, you return as a pregnant bride. You enter the world a changed being. And although no one but you knows of this wonderful romance, the world will, in a very short while, see the signs of your pregnancy, for you will begin to express that which you, in your hour of silence, felt yourself to be. The mother of the world or bride of the Lord is purposely called Mary, or water, for water loses its identity as it assumes the nature of that which with, it, with which it is mixed. Likewise, Mary, the receptive attitude of mind, must lose its identity as it assumes the nature of the thing desired. Only as one is willing to give up his present limitations and identity can he become that which he desires to be. Prayer is the formula by which such divorces and marriages are accomplished. Two shall agree as touching anything, and it shall be established on earth. The two agreeing are you, the bride, and the thing desired, the groom. As this agreement is accomplished, a son bearing witness of this union will be born. You begin to express and possess that which you are conscious of being. Praying, then, is recognizing yourself to be that which you desire to be, rather than begging God for that which you desire. Mm. Millions of prayers are daily unanswered, 
because man prays to a God who does not exist. Consciousness being God, one must seek in consciousness for the thing desired by assuming the consciousness of the quality desired. Only as one does this will his prayers be answered. To be conscious of being poor while praying for riches is to be rewarded with that which you are conscious of being, namely, poverty. Prayers, to be successful, must be claimed and appropriated. Assume the positive consciousness of the thing desired. With your desire defined, quietly go within and shut the door behind you. Lose yourself in your desire. Feel yourself to be one with it. Remain in this fixation until you have absorbed the life and name by claiming and feeling yourself to be and have that which you desired. When you emerge from the hour of prayer, you must do so conscious of being and possessing that which you heretofore desired. There's a few concepts going on here that I think are worthy of discussion. Kevin actually uh, brings up a question. It's more... I think it's more of a rhetorical question, but it's a good point because uh, Neville talked about how uh, in this metaphor the, the bride and groom uh, close the door and go into secret to do their their mutual creating. And he says, secret so friends and family don't put doubt in your head. That, that, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. No, I think that's exa- actually that's exactly it. Yeah. Is that instead of... Instead of telling people, they're going to just see when it happens. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing, because if you went back to the Middle Ages or even after the Enlightenment and the Reformation, if you went back to, uh, say, jolly old England and looked into the homes of of the wealthy and and the uh, the rich and and the, um, the, the nobility, and you looked in on a wedding or wedding feast, you would find that practically the entire family was joining them in their wedding chamber. Right. Which is, you know. To make sure. Yeah. To make sure everything (laughs) is, everything's got to work just so. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I think we, we've talked about this before that even in, in books that deal with success, even outside of law of attraction, just, you know, books that are for business success personal growth books that are about success, many of them will say to be careful who you tell your, you know, your goals and desires to. Right. Tell it to people who you know are going to support it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really what Neville is saying here is that no one needs to know but you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Now, on the other hand, you know, I can see the other side of it as well because I tell people this all the time that I'm coaching. It's like, um, how many people know that you want this thing? Especially mm-hmm. if it's something that deals with other people, which living on earth, most of the stuff that we want does is connected to other people, right? So if you want a relationship, if you want a, a job, how many people know you want that? Because it's likely that that's how those things are going to come to you mm-hmm. through other people. Well, so there's, there's that side. That's, you know, somewhat a different viewpoint from this. This ties into something that Jamie just commented on. She says, Neville saying to intend in secret is directly contrasting with Abraham Hicks's encouragement to talk about what you want a lot and speak it into being. She sees that as an interesting contrast. Yeah. And I think that, I think the way we can, if, you know, if we wanted to, if it was important to make both of those things right, we would, we would do that by speaking it aloud to ourselves speaking it aloud to people that we know are supportive of us and Mm -hmm. being careful to keep it a secret from people who may, you know, want to bring some doubt into the equation. But I don't know that I think, I think it's going to be different for different things. Honestly, there are some things that I've wanted and I made sure that everybody knew. And there are other things that I've decided to keep it to myself until it manifested. Exactly. So I, yeah. I think it's kind of an inner knowing thing where, you know, personally you will have to make that choice. Right. But I think, <laughs> and I think it's necessary. That's, I think that's one of the key tools, if you will, or steps to take in order to gain the confidence that you are a deliberate creator because you get to decide whether you're going to reveal or not reveal 
And you do so based on what you feel deep down inside is going to help you stay true to that which you're trying to focus on. So it makes right. total sense to me. This is a way of building up your self-confidence, really. Your confidence that you're a deliberate creator who gets what he or she wants. You know? Yeah, I like that. I think that's the truth. There's also, the, the, to me, this is the biggest part of the whole chapter. Uh, in, in the book, it's like in the, the third and second to last chapter. Uh, paragraph from the end on the page. I, I don't think it's broken down that way. But it's a section that says, praying then is recognizing yourself to be that which you desire to be rather than begging God for that which you desire. Millions of prayers are daily unanswered because man prays to a God who does not exist. Consciousness being God, one must seek in consciousness for the thing desired by assuming the consciousness of the quality desired. Now, I don't know that Neville necessarily saw it this way, I don't even know that his listeners saw it this way, but the way I see that is this is a direct challenge to the Christian approach of understanding prayer. This is a direct challenge. He's saying, literally, millions of prayers are daily unanswered because man prays to a God who does not exist. Who's that God who doesn't exist? It's it's that separate God. It's it's not the God who, who we're, we're the God. It's that separate being, that being in the sky, that deity that we pray oh. to, who may or may not listen to us, and who may or may not answer the prayer. And if they do, and if he does answer it, the answer may be no. That's that's the God that doesn't exist. That's a direct challenge. That's powerful too. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really big. That, that I, I don't know that most of his followers at the time that he was doing this recognized that, especially since he was doing this in a church. <laughs> I don't think they realized what he was doing. This, this is, this is, uh, this is revolutionary here. This, this is basically revolting well, against the, the, the traditional, um, approach. And he goes on to say this, this stood out to me, um, to be conscious of being poor while praying for riches mm -hmm. is to be rewarded with that, which you are conscious of being, namely sure. poverty. Yeah. So again, he's, he's talking about, what I think is so interesting is how important our con our state of consciousness is because when he talks about to be conscious of being poor while praying for riches, I mean, this, this person's prayer is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're actually doing something. They're praying for riches. They're doing some kind of spiritual work, right? They're taking action. They're going into their closet, maybe, you know, the metaphorical prayer closet. They're shutting <laughs> themselves away. They're praying for riches. And yet they're conscious of being poor. And that's what they're going to reap is uh, the result of that, he says, the reward of poverty. And so the consciousness part is the key here mm. but how often do we not take any note of the consciousness part and just go about doing whatever action that we're doing to create whatever it is and oftentimes like abraham talks about the the coin having two sides the the abundant side and the lack side right the wealth and the lack of wealth or whatever it is we want and so when we are in all of our work that we're doing when we're focused on the fact that we don't have it yet, we're undoing what we're doing right at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm a knitter. It's like knitting a stitch, pulling the stitch out, knitting another stitch, pulling the stitch out. I'm never going to get anywhere if I keep undoing everything I'm doing. And so if right. my consciousness says I have a lack, then it's just a, a waste of effort. And yet, here's an interesting point, because you, you actually alluded to this a moment ago. You talked for a minute there about, or for a moment anyway, about how, yes, they go into their prayer closet, I think you called it. And yes, in some way their prayer is being answered, but they themselves are going into poverty. And that made me think of something that Linda Armstrong likes to say very often. She, she, she'll talk about how she's walking down the street, and she'll see somebody, she'll just send some energy their way, send some love their way. Knowing that even if that person doesn't receive it, and this is the key point, the energy, the love doesn't go for, for waste. It gets used somewhere. So even if they can't receive it, somebody yeah. else gets it. It always goes somewhere else. So tying it into what, what you were saying, when we put out a request for riches and some sort of doubt prevents us from getting them, the riches were created. <laughs> they just don't end up necessarily in our pocket. They end up in somebody else's pocket. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. I like that a lot. Yeah. 
Because our thoughts and ideas and our words are powerful. They certainly are. Yeah, much yeah. more powerful than that. We're still learning. I mean, I think we're beginning to understand just how powerful they are, but we're still learning how powerful they are. They are amazingly, oh, immensely powerful. Be yeah. yeah. So getting our consciousness lined up, being in alignment with that thing, being the person that has that thing, mm -hmm. stepping into that idea, that that's the key. Yeah, already being great. that person. And what did he say about uh, making the impression, you know, that we already have to be in that state. We have to be in that state already for the impression to even be made. Yes. Ooh. I mean, it's a receptive yeah. state. That's that male-female dichotomy that he describes. It has to be a receptive state in order to receive the impression. Right. So we have a so, new understanding now of prayer that I think exceeds what we talked about at the beginning. We, we both talked about how the Christian view of prayer is, is much more limited. Um, indeed, what many religions teach about prayer is much more limited. The understanding that we have was broader. It includes thoughts, includes intentions, includes spells, includes everything that we put out there. And I think that, that that's all very accurate. But Neville takes that to another, whoops, he takes it to another step. He takes it to another place right. because for him, prayer becomes a very specific mechanism for exercising consciousness as god that that's yes. that that's big that that that's that's an even bigger step than saying all of our words all of our thoughts are prayer cuz now we're turning it right. into an intentional thing right is that the consciousness the state of consciousness that we're in and if we're including all of our thoughts all of our wishes all of our intentions brainstorms prayers spells all of that then it's going to be really important the state of consciousness we're in for all of that, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is like 24-7, right? So it's it's walking in alignment with what it is we want, not for uh, 68 seconds or whatever, but all the time. All the time. It's a practice. That's yeah. Right. And as we really practice, powerful stuff. The, the, I mean, where was the, the quote at the beginning? I think it said it pretty well, if I can find where it was. Uh, maybe it was in the previous chapter. But the, the, the general thought was that, like we were talking about, all of our thoughts are prayers. They are all, in a sense, beseeching something of what we often call the universe to be delivered via the law of attraction, by the law of similar vibration. And right. as we put these thoughts out there, they gain power. Well, that means every thought, because we are all powerful beings, Every thought we put out there has power behind it. So if we put right. out there thoughts that don't serve us, we just put out thoughts that don't serve us with power behind them. Yes. We, we just put power into stuff that we don't believe in. <laughs> it's it's like a, it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you put out there. You're going to get it back. I think Abraham said something like, worrying is like praying for what you don't want. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when we're worrying over something, we're in a state of consciousness, and that's what gets produced. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's the same thing. It's just a, it's an inner, it's a thought energy, and we know that thoughts become things. So it's the state that we're in all the time. Mm -hmm. We want to be in alignment with what it is that we want all the time. <laughs> now, now, when I said that it was a cautionary tale, there, I just realized there's also like a fear com component to that. And that really wasn't what I was trying to convey, but it is there. So I want to straighten that part out a little bit. Because literally, we spend a lot of time in what we call contrasts. And that includes mm -hmm. thinking about stuff we don't like, that we don't appreciate, that, we don't, that, that feels bad to us, that feels unpleasant, uncomfortable. And that contrast leads to expansion. So it's all good. It's all right. good. So the cautionary part isn't, oh, you shouldn't focus on stuff that you don't want. The cautionary part is just be aware. If you focus on what you don't want, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride. It's all working out great. Just be aware that's where you're going. Well, and we're going to be aware of things we don't want because that's contrast. Right. Right. And so it's what we do with that awareness. Mm -hmm. Do we recognize that I'm aware of this thing I don't want? And so I, I'm going to find the solution. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on what I do want. You know, right. it's, it's, it's the pivot. It's the being able to align myself with the consciousness of what I do want instead of what I don't want. 
you know, and you mentioned fear. I think fear is, can be really useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is part of our emotional makeup. A lot of times fear is part of our uh, system of intuition Mm -hmm. and we need to pay attention to things that we're feeling afraid of, to things that bring fear and deal with it in a way that we would deal with it if we believed that we were powerful creators. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It doesn't mean we go cower away or hide unless, you know, unless that's what we feel like we should do. It might save our life. It just depends. It can work either way. You just have to be open to all of those different awarenesses and recognize that our state of consciousness is going to start directing what happens. So ultimately, what we experience. I think what we're discussing here then is the importance of accepting all of who we are, all of what we are. Yes. All of what our experiences are. And am Mm -hmm. I, is part of me that which attracts the things that I love? Yes. Is part of me the, the part that attracts things I don't love? Yes. Is, 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 is part of me that which attracts things that make me joyful? Yes. Is it, is part of me that which attracts to me things that are horrible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's all <laughs> yes. The answer is always yes. And that's not always a yes. bad thing. That's a great thing. That's an empowering thing. That's, that's where we really come to appreciate just how powerful we are and start to feel the confidence that comes from that. There's a tremendous self-confidence that comes from recognizing I do all of this. I make yeah. all of this happen. This life that I'm living is is happening because I'm living it. It's my living of it that's making it happen. And this is a good thing. And how we experience everything is directly connected to our sense of identity. Yeah. And so Neville is encouraging us to know what that sense of identity is, that we are God, that, that our imagination, our consciousness is the creator mm-hmm. and that we have the power to create. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it goes back to that again. It all goes back to that, the state of consciousness that we're in, which is really great. So, well, this has been yeah, good. As you, we got, we got two chapters. There were times there when, you know, some of these chapters we would do, we would get like you know, a quarter of the chapter and, and that was the entire show. <laughs> now, now we're doing <laughs> entire chapters in pairs. That's pretty good. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think it shows how wow. much we've come to understand what Neville's terminology is really all about. We've got the decoder ring down. <laughs> we do. That's <laughs> which, true. Which is a good thing. <laughs> hey, I want to remind everybody: if you're not yet a subscriber to the podcast, this is a great opportunity to do it. You know, you, you can see this is this is good stuff that we do, and every single episode is different. Um, but you want you don't want to miss any of them because they're all daily doses of happy. So become a subscriber. Go to the homepage of our website, LOAToday.net, and you will see right at the top of the page a link, a great big link, labeled just for your. Device. You click it, it walks you through a little wizard, and just like that, you're subscribed. And once you're subscribed, make sure that you also listen and share the fact that you're listening so that more and more people can get their daily doses of happy. And also, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that Cindy Chavez is one of the great life coaches on the planet. Cindy, how do they reach out to you (laughs) if they want to get your great insight and assistance? Oh, well, you can reach out to me at my website, cindychavez.com, C-I-N-D-I-E, D-H-A-V-E-Z dot com. I would love to hear from you. Give me a shout out. Come and say hello. <laughs> always a wonderful thing to do. We love hearing from from um, our listeners, too. I mean, if it's just a hello, that's oh, always great. That part's... I'm yes. just, just getting the message. I, I get the email, right? You know, somebody filled in a form on the website, and, and the email tells me the subject line, LOA Today website contact, and I get goosebumps. Like, ooh, who, which listener contacted us today? I wonder who it is. It's always great. It's fun. It's, it's always really, really great. Fun. Of course, I share yeah. it with all the right, you know, the appropriate co-hosts who are, you know, the, the question or the, the uh, message is, is addressed to. I make sure everybody hears about it. So, yeah, it's good stuff. So thank you for all that you're doing to share this with us. We really appreciate that. I, I, I said it at well, the beginning, and I you. love it here, too. I mean, you, you, your insights really do serve, and, and I appreciate it very much. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I, I enjoy it, too. It's been wonderful. I look forward to coming back next week. and We'll do it again. Continuing on. Neville and, chapter, right. And we're going to be in the middle of more Christian core concepts because the next chapter is entitled The Twelve <laughs> Disciples. So we, we have not left the core stuff behind yet. <laughs> it's going to be good. But thank you to our live stream listeners. Thank you to the uh, blog podcast listeners. Or not blog, the podcast listeners as well because, I mean, that's where the majority of listeners are anyway. We really do appreciate you as well. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.